hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to this new session of the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute. Um, I'm Nick Lazeron. It's my honor today to welcome William Wright and Nathan Sheets to uh, discuss uh, Brexit and the first observations after it actually happened. Obviously, the UK left the European Union almost a year ago, but it only left the single market, which is what's really important for financial services, uh, barely a few weeks ago on January 1st, and that's what we want to focus on. And for that, we have two great speakers today. William Wright uh, is the uh, head of New Financial, a think tank in London, which, uh, as its name suggests, is focused on the financial sector and which he created um, in 2014. Uh, William studied uh, modern history at Oxford at University of London. Uh, he then uh, taught uh, English uh, and uh, worked in the banking sector at NatWest at the time. And in uh, the mid-90s, he uh, joined Financial News, uh, of which he became editor in 2003, and which he developed into a well-recognized uh, source of uh, expert information uh, on the financial sector. And he sold it uh, successfully to the Wall Street Journal in 2007. So uh, William's entrepreneurial drive was already uh, there at the time and uh, stayed there until 2011, but not uh, without having also completed a degree at INSEAD uh, in executive management uh, in 2007. Uh, so um, I have to say, I, I, I rely a lot as a researcher and analyst on William's uh, output. Uh, he, has, uh, he has produced a number of uh, influential reports on uh, the state of uh, capital markets uh, in the UK, in the EU, and globally. Uh, so, uh, so he's uh, extremely well placed to give us insight on what's happening on the ground uh, in uh, in the very early uh, days of uh, Brexit outside of the single market. Joining us uh, also today is Nathan Chief. Uh, Nathan uh, is, of course, chief economist and head of international economics at the PGIM, the investment arm of. Uh, uh, Prudential, uh, the uh, uh, American insurance company. And uh, Nathan studied at Brigham Young University, uh, uh, got his PhD in economics at MIT in 1993, after which he joined the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, where he had a very distinguished career with uh, uh, um, uh, an inter a brief interruption uh, in 2006, 2007, uh, when he was senior advisor at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, at the Fed, he was director of the Division of International Finance uh, from 2007 to 2011, uh, and thus one of the uh, three uh, economists joined, uh, sitting on the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, after that, he joined Citigroup, uh, where he was global head of international e economics, and then when he came back to the public sector at the U.S. Treasury as Under Secretary for International Finance uh, between uh, 2014 and 2017. So Nathan has extraordinary experience in financial uh, services policy, not just domestically in the US, but also very much in the international setting, which is relevant for our discussion today, particularly in G20 and other international negotiation formats. But the most important thing is that in 2017, uh, after leaving the US uh, Treasury, he was uh, a fellow at the Peterson Institute, uh, and therefore um, a colleague before joining um, PGIM later that year. I should mention also that uh, Nathan is very uh, involved in the community and in particular as the president of the Washington State, as it's called, of the uh, Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, and, uh, and uh, other community involvements, uh, which uh, add to uh, his range of uh, perspectives. So enough from my exp um, uh, introduction and over to you, uh, William. Uh, thank you, Nicola, and uh, thank you in particular for that, that generous introduction um, and for the kind invitation to, to join you today to share some headline thoughts on the initial impact uh, of Brexit on the City of London. Um, Honoured and delighted to join you today. Good, good morning, good afternoon to everybody uh, on the call. As Nicola said, my name is William Wright. I'm the founder and managing director of New Financial. Uh, we make the case for bigger and better capital markets in Europe uh, and beyond. Uh, and it's fair to say that in the last few years, our work has been hijacked uh, by Brexit. Um, so to set the scene, I'm just going to quickly run through five key areas today. Uh, and I will stick to the 10 minutes, I promise, Nicola. Firstly, where are we now? Uh, secondly, how important is equivalence to the City of London? 
Uh, a quick look at the initial impact of Brexit on the city, some adjusted working practices, which is perhaps a little bit of a euphemism we'll see in a few moments, uh, and then looking ahead, what happens next? So let's start with uh, where are we now? Um, as we've been warning a new financial for more than a year, the city has ended up with what you might call no deal plus. Nothing substantive in the trade deal itself for financial services, uh, and two temporary uh, equivalence decisions, clearing and settlement to soften the blow. The pie chart that you can see on the left here shows that of the 39 potential equivalence agreements uh, in financial services, the UK has been granted two. There are a further 25 types of equivalents that have been granted by the EU in financial services to other third countries, but have not been granted to the UK. And there are a further, it being the EU, there are a further 12 types of equivalents that exist in theory but not in practice, and which haven't been granted to anyone. But you can see that two out of 39 or two out of 27, depending on which way you want to look at it, uh, is a long way from the permanent and comprehensive equivalence that the UK was asking for a year ago. Now, given the UK Prime Minister's um, fondness for talking about no deal Brexit as Australia style, another way of thinking about the UK's deal, the city's deal, is Australia minus. On the right, you can see where uh, you know, the equivalence decisions in finance agreements in financial services with different countries uh, up on the left hand side at the very top US 23 Australia 19 UK right down on the right hand side with two equivalence decisions that's the same as Taiwan and Thailand um, or if we put a slightly more positive gloss on it uh, it's twice as many as Albania and Bosnia Herzegovina so let's have a look at the value of equivalence. How important is equivalence to the city of London? And the answer, of course, is, well, it depends. Overall, perhaps it's not that important. The pie chart on the left here shows some research by uh, the Bank of England that suggests that of the 300 billion pounds in revenues for UK financial services, uh, only 10% of that, 30 billion, comes from the EU. And of that, only a third, 10 billion, is dependent on equivalence. Now I have to say I, I've, I've queried that research with the Bank of England, I haven't heard anything back from them, but it sounds a little bit on the low side to me. But what's clear is that in some sectors, the impact of equivalent, the value of equivalence uh, is, uh, is much higher. On the right hand side here, you can see the split between equity trading activity in the UK, between trading in UK stocks, that's the gray segment, about 60% of all trading activity by value in the UK is UK stocks, and trading in EU 27 stocks under equivalence, um, about 40% of all trading activity in the UK. And that trading activity is of course entirely dependent uh, on, on equivalence for stock exchanges. William, uh, sorry to uh, interrupt you, but uh, I guess the right-hand chart is before uh, the cut-off date of Brexit, right? Yes, sorry, that's as the, the, the full year, the, the latest comprehensive full year data that we're comfortable with is 2019. And it's roughly a 40-60 split. And also, I assume many of our audience uh, are familiar with equivalence, but can you briefly remind us of how it's defined and uh, what it is, basically? Uh, that's a question from Ted Truman. Uh, okay, um, in its broader sense, equivalence is a recognition by, with the EU and a third country, a country outside of the EU, that in certain sectors of activity, the, the, the framework, the regulatory framework, the rule book, uh, is sufficiently equivalent in terms of outcome that the EU allows a degree of access for firms in that third country to access the EU market. So um, it's, an, it's an administrative decision by the commission. Is there any check or balance on the administrative power of the commission or is it uh, uh, offici discretionary? Uh, officially, of course, it is an administrative technical decision. Um, but in practice, it has become an increasingly politicized decision, which has led to some pressure in European institutions that if it is a political decision, as we saw with Switzerland in 2019, with the UK uh, in 2020, um, that perhaps it needs, should have some more political oversight from the European Parliament or the Econ Committee, which it doesn't currently have. So there is no recourse, right? If, you're, if you think you have right to an equivalence, but you don't get it, there's nothing you can do. You, you can get angry and you can continue to call and email and lobby 
uh, commission officials, but there's no, there is no official appeal procedure uh, that I'm aware of. Thank you and sorry for the interruption. No problem, no problem. Um, so then let's also look at here a couple of other sectors uh, in terms of the value of equivalence on the left-hand side, uh, clearing. One of the totemic issues in the Brexit debate, and one day I'll understand why, because I don't fully understand that yet, um, but just 12% of the value of derivatives contracts through UK central counterparties uh, are with EU clearing members uh, and therefore subject to equivalence, uh, uh, equivalence in clearing. And on the right hand side, just 7% of derivatives activity in the UK is subject to this other element of equivalence called the, the, the derivatives or affected by the derivatives trading obligation. So what you see is that equivalence in some sectors is pretty important, but in others, around 10, 12% of activity. So let's turn to the initial impact of Brexit on the City of London. We've been tracking financial services firms in the UK over the last few years uh, that have relocated something to somewhere in the EU in response to Brexit. We're publishing an update in a few months time. It's still a work in progress, but what we've identified so far is just over 400 firms that have moved something. Um, to put that in context, that up, that's up from around 330 firms that we had identified the last time we published this research in October 2019. Uh, the, 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 the column chart on the left shows the wide distribution of relocations to different financial centers by number of firms. And on the right hand side, we've got this is something I was chatting about with Nicolai a few weeks ago, uh, perhaps the purest measure or well, the purest way of measuring the impact of Brexit. The pie chart on, on top shows where banks from outside the EU, US, Swiss, uh, Japanese, Chinese banks, where they choose to locate the 4 trillion euros or so in assets uh, that they have based in the EU. And as of the end of 2019, three quarters of these assets were located in the, in the UK and just one quarter in the rest of the EU. But since then, chart underneath, we know that at least 450 billion euros in bank assets have been transferred from the UK to the EU by the big five US banks alone, which takes that split to a maximum of 65%, 35%, with more relocations still to come. And sorry for another interruption, William, but for clarification, when your uh, chart title says non-EU bank assets in the EU, you mean the EU 28, including the UK, of course. Uh, uh, these, yeah, these, sorry, these, the, the yes, the, 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 the snapshot here is end of 2019, when it officially included uh, the UK. The estimate is our estimate, it's not an e ECB estimate. Um, the data, I'm sure they will, they will publish in good time. Uh, and then another way of looking at the impact of Brexit is the shift in activity in some specific markets. The left-hand side here, we've got trading in EU 27 stocks, again, full year 2019, the last year for which we have fully comparable data. Uh, and our estimate is that 43% of the trading in EU 27 stocks took place in 2019, was taking place in the UK, uh, on UK exchanges, UK platforms, uh, under equivalence. And in the first few weeks of this year, you can see that without equivalence, virtually all of that has shifted to the EU. And then on the right hand side, we've got the location of euro and sterling denominated interest rate swaps trading. In December last year, just 11% of those trading volumes in both euro and sterling denominated interest rate swaps was taking place in the US on swap execution facilities according to IHS market. Now it's early days, but in the first few weeks of this year, IHS market thinks that that share has more than doubled from 11% to 23% in both Euro and denominated swaps, a direct impact uh, of the withdrawal of equivalence, or the lack, not the withdrawal, the, the, the non-granting of equivalence. And what we've also seen as a result of all of this is some adjust, what you might call adjusted working practices. Now, for many firms in, this, in, in, in banking and finance, Brexit effectively happened one or two years ago. They did their contingency planning and they've moved whatever they needed to move. They've moved as much as they needed to move and not a single person more. But some firms seem to have taken quite a 
creative approach um, to Brexit relocation, if we can call it that. Um, and it's led to some accidental and perhaps some less accidental stretching of the rules. Uh, there are some examples uh, on this slide. Uh, perhaps my favorite is, uh, is a number of firms that, <coughs> that we understand have given their staff .eu email addresses uh, and European SIM cards, mobile phones, uh, cell phones, so that it looks and sounds like they've been relocated to the EU when actually they're still sitting in London. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, ESMA has taken a pretty uh, unimpressed, dim view of this and already um, fired a warning shot back to banks in the, uh, the UK saying effectively, you know, we know where your staff live. Um, and interestingly, this week, we saw the very first sighting in the wild of a UK based firm that has had to suspend operations, suspend business with some European clients because uh, it had not moved sufficient number of people. It didn't have the substance in its EU, uh, enter, in its EU operations um, for, uh, for the local supervisor, in this case in France, um, to, to allow it to continue to service EU, EU clients. You're and then referring, finally, you're, you're sorry, referring to ICAP. Uh, yeah, TP ICAP. Yeah, yeah they, 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 had, they had planned to move 80 to 100 people to Paris. Um, I, they've said that the pandemic made it difficult for them to do so, um, which is you know, an additional logistical problem. Um, but it's unclear whether every firm affected by Brexit in the city of London has fully appreciated the impact that it would have on their day-to-day -day business. Um, before that impact actually kicked in. And then final, uh, final quick few thoughts on what happens next. Firstly, it's been a lot of talk about the MOU um, between the UK and EU that may be signed by March. Uh, I wouldn't expect too much in that MOU, perhaps, and I'm sure Nathan will be talking about this uh, in a few moments, some sort of informal regulatory cooperation along the lines of the UK, uh, UK US uh, regulatory cooperation today. Um, I wouldn't invest too much hope in anything resembling a deal in financial services by the end of March. Uh, more access, more equivalence. Hard to see why the EU would grant more access and more equivalence. We think actually it's more likely that the EU will feel emboldened when it looks back at the last few weeks. And it's more likely to look at how it can squeeze harder and tighter and perhaps look at repatriating activity in other sectors beyond uh, equity trading, derivatives and clearing. In terms of thinking about the long-term rebalancing, I think think of it as a 20, rewinding the clock 20 years, not a seismic shift uh, in, from London to, to, to the EU. And then in the longer term, the econo economic impact of Brexit uh, on the city, clearly in a number of sectors, it is binary and negative, but perhaps uh, it has been oversaw, the impact has been overstated on the industry as a whole. Thank you very much. That's some opening comments from me. Uh, I look forward to the discussion, to Nathan's comments, and uh, no doubt some more forensic questions from Nicola uh, and, uh, and the participants on the call today. Thank you. Thank you, William. That was superb. And uh, I encourage uh, participants to ask questions through the, the Q&A tool uh, that we have in, uh, on this platform. And now uh, over to you, uh, Nathan. All right. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. Let me just start by uh, uh, thanking William for that uh, superb uh, presentation. Uh, I will try to make three high level points uh, during my time here. The first is that uh, as uh, Brexit proceeded, I always thought of the worst case outcome as being one that generated meaningful financial stability risks for the UK, for Europe, and the global uh, system. And I think the good news is uh, those really don't seem to be present in any meaningful way. And I think what it reflects is that uh, large financial institutions have been preparing for this kind of an outcome. A full-scale hard Brexit was a real risk. And the large institutions, many smaller ones, have been preparing for uh, this uh, over the last four and a half years. And so uh, broadly speaking, the system has been protected. 
and uh, it's it's gone uh, it's gone smoothly. Rather, I see the issue that we're discussing today in terms of of London's competitiveness, the composition of of UK GDP, and uh, maybe even uh, as as a set of commercial issues for the United Kingdom to think about. So I think of this as more what will uh, London look like. How preeminent will it be in the global system? How preeminent will finance be uh, in the UK economy? And these are issues for them to uh, struggle with. Now, it may also, what we're discussing today, may also uh, have, and this is kind of more on the negative side of the ledger, uh, some implications for financial fragmentation with implications for financial uh, efficiency. And, uh, you know, when we look at economic activity and, you know, for example, swaps trading or equities trading, to the extent that it gets strewn uh, all over the world and various financial centers uh, don't have the same critical mass uh, in economies of scale that London had before, there could be some uh, efficiency loss there. Now, William's presentation, and I don't mean to put words in his mouth, I'd love to have his views on this issue, but William's presentation seemed to leave me reasonably comfortable that if that's occurring, it's unlikely to be a first order issue. But let me, let me pose that as a question uh, rather, than, rather than make a statement. Uh, I would say one other dimension where we could think of uh, uh, efficiency losses in addition to the loss scale is increased transactions costs. And over the last few days, we saw uh, uh, news, for example, the MasterCard was gonna start uh, charging a uh, increased surcharge on transaction from the UK uh, into the European Union. And uh, that may manifest itself in other ways uh, as well. Second high level observation, uh, despite all of this, I remain relatively sanguine about London's future. I think that London will always be a major uh, financial center. Uh, stepping back even a notch, I think there will always be a major uh, financial centers and activities in Europe. And I think part of that reflects the European economy and the size of the banking system, but it critically also reflects the time zone. Bottom line, uh, London, the continent, these are better places to do global business uh, than New York and Singapore, because you're able to catch, uh, you're able to catch uh, uh, North America uh, in, in, in the morning and uh, you're able to catch uh, uh, Asia in the afternoon. Maybe I have that turned around, but you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. Uh, so I think that there will be a financial center uh, in Europe. Uh, London will be core. It has first mover advantage. It has the, the advantage of being fully English speaking and deep ties to the United States, which is, is helpful. More broadly, it offers attractive amenities for those in the financial sector. Now, it, I think with COVID and the management of COVID, I'm hearing more grumbling, and it's gonna be interesting to see the, the extent to which that's uh, undercut. So I really see this discussion we're having as being that of what is the distribution of employment uh, between London and the continent? Uh, without Brexit, we'd probably be saying 95% of the financial sector jobs uh, uh, would be international finance would be in London and 5% on the continent or maybe 90-10. With it, I think the debate is, do we land at 70-30 or is it more like 50-50? Uh, final point I wanted to make is about equivalency uh, and, and, and drawing on my uh, time at the US Treasury. I was involved to some extent in the discussions that the United States had with the European Union, trying to get equivalents for uh, US swaps executions platforms, uh, including uh, the CME. 
Uh, those uh, negotiations dragged on for a number of years, were contentious, they were frustrating. Our sense was that uh, the regulation that we were doing was just as good as that that the European was, was, was asking for, but it was just different in certain respects. And uh, those differences, which we felt weren't really bottom line in terms of the quality of supervision, stood in the way of that equivalence for, for a number of years. So given my experience, I would be hesitant in expecting the, UK, uh, the EU to come forward quickly uh, with, uh, with findings of, of equivalence, uh, at least in those sectors where it's not immediately in their, their commercial uh, interests. And uh, I will stop there, Nicola. Thank you, Nathan. Um, that, was, uh, that was a great perspective uh, and obviously a lot of uh, what uh, the US has been through in equivalence uh, discussions uh, is the future for the UK. So uh, uh, there will be scope for technology transfer. I also know that if your proportion is correct, that you know the, the EU 27 had five to 10% of that market that gets to 30 to 50%, that means that even if London remains very big, that's a lot of growth in Europe, a lot of new uh, activity. Uh, do I get that right? I, yes, and I think that's exactly the right framework. We haven't seen a huge bleeding of jobs out of the city. Uh, I think Andrew Bailey has said that uh, London's lost, lost 7,500 jobs or so, but I really think that that is the wrong metric. I think the right metric is where is employment in London's financial sector versus the no Brexit counterfactual. And I think relative to that, it is down substantial. Uh, one firm that I know uh, quite well, uh, pre-Brexit probably had one or 2% of its employment uh, in the continent. Uh, uh, at present, it's more like 15 to 20% and growing. And uh, at the same time, that firm has expanded employment in London, but a good chunk of the expansion that would have happened is, uh, is on the continent. Uh, William, I have a clarification question from Thomas Ray. Uh, he writes, uh, William's charts showed uh, 403 businesses have moved that sounds like an impressive number, but what proportion of firms in the city of London is that? Can you give us uh -huh. a, uh, uh, the, the share? Uh, no, that is a very good question. Off the top of my head, I can't, but it is a, it is a minority of firms in the city of London. And, and to be absolutely clear, those 403 moves, and the report that we're publishing does go into a little more detail on this, but the, the, the 403 moves, that, that ranges from an asset management firm setting up a, a new legal subsidiary in Luxembourg or Dublin at one end to a big investment bank uh, like Bank of America setting up entirely new businesses, relocating its banking activity to Dublin and its, uh, its markets act EU markets activity to, 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 to Paris. That's right. Um, so it's a huge okay. range, okay. but we don't have a percentage. Yeah. Um, there is uh, also on this, there's a question from uh, Antonio Revuelta Mar Martos on Dublin. Uh, it's striking that Dublin has a head start. So two questions, actually. Antonio's question is, is that just because of language or is that too simplistic? And I would add a question, which is on the basis of what you're observing now, you said you would have an update in March. Uh, does this uh, uh, dominance of Dublin continue to be the case or is that something that was linked to the early phase specifically? Um, that's a good, good, good question. First, first point, um, why? Um, it's twofold. One, I think there is a, there, there, there is a language proximity, ease of travel, um, culture, legal system, so on, so on, that makes Dublin perhaps uh, a more attractive uh, immediate option for, uh, for, enough, for lots of firms. More importantly, I think, is the, what our research found is the importance of sector specialization and relocations. The vast majority of firms moving of the relocations to Dublin are in asset management and to a lesser extent, uh, alternative investments. The vast majority of firms moving to Frankfurt are banks or investment banks. The vast majority of firms moving to Amsterdam 
exchanges, trading platforms, brokers. There's a very clear um, sector specialization emerging in financial centers in Europe uh, through these relocations that perhaps um, is gonna be an interesting trend to track in future years. A little bit like the, the sector specialization or act, specialization by activity of different financial centers in the US. Uh, what about Paris? So uh, you didn't mention it. Uh, does it have a sector profile? Paris is the only one really that doesn't have that sort of deep sector profile. It, it, it's already um, the largest, uh, the, the largest center in terms of insurance and asset management in the EU. And it would certainly like to build on both of those. But the distribution of firms that are choosing Paris is much, um, uh, is much broader. What we also do in the research, which isn't captured in those headline charts, we break the relocations into where are firms moving their EU headquarters and where are they also moving additional operations? And what we're seeing is that Paris has the lowest share of the big financial centers of EU hubs, but it has a relatively high share of secondary uh, relocations. What we take from that is that Paris is not necessarily somewhere where firms want to have the legal headquarters for their EU business, but it is somewhere where they want, where, where more of their staff want to live and work. Um, and it is somewhere where in certain sectors, such as trading, there is a deep pool uh, of, of, of talent um, uh, in the local market. So when you just refer to EU hub, you mean uh, legal incorporation, right? Yeah, yeah, the legal headquarters, legal incorporation, where, where they'll be supervised, uh, the headquarters for their EU business. Uh, I see that Mark Bolliat uh, has uh, asked for the floor and uh, he's, uh, he's very qualified. So uh, let me allow him to uh, talk. And uh, Mark, I think you have to unmute. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was the political leader of the City of London from 2012 to 2017, so heavily involved in Brexit. I just want to say I agree entirely with everything both of the speakers have said, and this was entirely predictable two or three years ago, and I think some in the city were very slow to realise what was happening. Uh, the big institutions made their mind up soon after the referendum that the business in the EU would have to be done from the EU. And in terms of job losses, I agree, it's not a question of looking at how many people have moved, that's tiny. It's what are the number of people now employed as opposed to what would it have been? So that's more of a comment than a question. I suppose the one question is why has the British government been willing to sacrifice an industry or a large chunk of an industry with a potential loss of tax revenue on a reasonable estimate of 10 billion in the long term in exchange for fish? I know it's not a fair comparison, but I think the answer is that actually politically in the short term, it's not a problem. And I'd welcome views on that. So you've already asked, uh, answered your question, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll collect uh, other responses from our speakers. But I have a question to you, Mark, uh, because you've been such a privileged um, observer and actually, actually participant. Uh, there's been a perception that the city, I mean, you're right that the, the government has kind of thrown the city under the bus. But the city itself was not very vocal uh, in that whole period of negotiation. It wasn't very much in the public space. Uh, is that perception unfair? How did you feel about this? And uh, exposed, do you think there should have been scope for more, uh, you know, assertive um, uh, stance of the financial industry as a whole and its representatives in the UK? I thought I was pretty vocal, um, but it was difficult for many city institutions. As you know, the biggest institutions are not British and they didn't want to get involved in a British political debate. And also, you know, the JP Morgans, Morgan Stanley, Citibank, they're not particularly concerned about the financial services industry in Britain. They're concerned about their business. And for them, having to move a number of staff and functions is a costly irritant, but no more than that. The financial services industry has survived Brexit very well. The damage is not to the industry at all. It is predominantly to Britain. And also in the points being made, the financial markets are now marginally less efficient, but that's all. So I don't think the city could have done much more. The British government took an early view 
that it was not going to get the sort of deal it would ideally like on financial services because the price the EU would extract for this was going to be too great. That's very powerful. Thank you so much, Mark. And I see that Angus Canvin uh, also uh, has uh, a hand raised. So let me give him the floor and you can then mute yourself, Angus. Yeah, look, just uh, in, in response to your, your comment, uh, uh, Nicola, um, I mean, I agree with, 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 with uh, Mark. Yourself, Angus. Sorry? Maybe introduce yourself. No. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, Angus Cameron, Director of International uh, Affairs at uh, UK Finance, which is the trade association representing the uh, banking and payments uh, industry, uh, you know, those firms doing that sort of business in and from uh, the UK. So all those uh, institutions Mark just mentioned uh, are our members. Um, so I'm just going to uh, agree with what uh, Mark said, but to, to point out that uh, on both sides, um, there was no uh, willing audience for what the city had to say. And that became apparent pretty quickly <laughs> uh, after the 2016 referendum. Uh, I mean, certainly on the EU side, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, the city's interests were not, <laughs> did not factor into the uh, strategy for the negotiations of the future relationship with the UK. On the UK side, uh, you know, as Mark said, um, there was a political decision taken, uh, as you put it, to throw the city under the under the bus. The city was initially very vocal, um, very clear uh, on what it thought ought, ought, to, ought to be done. Um, but we uh, very quickly realized, uh, representative bodies in the city, uh, that uh, you know, we were wasting our time, in, in effect. Uh, and worse than that, as far as the UK government uh, was concerned, and that became especially true uh, with the, with the uh, uh, arrival of the uh, Johnson uh, government, that uh, we were seeing, uh, yeah, our comments were counterproductive in the, in the sense that uh, uh, they cost us, uh, cost us in, in terms of influence and relevance to the UK authorities. So you mean if you said- having, that, having no effect. If you said why the Johnson government would instinctively say black and uh, vice versa, right? Yeah, we were just not a, a, a political priority, not a consideration in in their their strategy for the for the future relationship with the EU. So uh, both <laughs> both parties we were effectively irrelevant to. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I I apologise to uh, the two speakers because I've taken time uh, for what I took more as testimonies and questions. Uh, but uh, but uh, to me, it's been a, a very uh, important dimension of the sequence, uh, this uh, interaction between the, the trade bodies, the City of London, UK finance, uh, and the uh, UK government and EU authorities. Uh, uh, Nathan and William, any comments on that? Uh, two, two thoughts. First of all, I think it's both Mark and Angus uh, emphasized. Uh, given political realities everywhere, it is a very challenging thing for politicians to throw their arms around bankers. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me from a, you know, a realpolitik political strategy perspective that uh, uh, protecting finance was not high on the UK government's list. Now, my second comment is a little bit in, in tension with that. And that is, I think, perhaps another factor that could have worked in is I wonder at how willing the European Union was to really make uh, compromises uh, in this space. Uh, uh, from, from the day after Brexit, uh, the European Union and European officials were mobilizing efforts to gain commercial advantage and to strengthen uh, the continent's position in finance as a result of Brexit. Uh, it was most pronounced probably uh, from the French, uh, but uh, more broadly. So I wonder how much receptivity, even if it had been a key priority uh, for uh, the, the UK government, how much receptivity there would have been uh, in Brussels to it. William? Uh, you're on mute. I would, um, 
I, I completely agree with that, that, that the last point from, from, from Nathan, but I would, I'm not gonna win myself any friends here, but, but I would challenge this idea that the, the, the city has been thrown under a bus. Um, you know, there is obviously a negative impact for the city and there are plenty of people in the city who quite rightly and you know, would, would prefer that this had turned out differently. But once you take certain political decisions, such as the ref to hold a referendum, to lose that referendum, to then decide that you're going to leave the single market and that you're not going to allow oversight of the ECJ and you're not going to allow uh, free movement of people, and you insist on getting a deal done with an artificial time frame, then we are where we are. It, it leads you automatically and has done over the last four years to where we are. And then on top of that, I think the government's position in the UK has been very much that the city is big enough to cope. It is far, far easier for an investment bank or an asset management firm to adapt to Brexit by setting up a new subsidiary or changing the license in an existing branch in the EU than it is for a car manufacturer in Sunderland or a, a widget manufacturer in Birmingham. Um, that doesn't mean that it's easy or not an enormous headache for firms to make that, uh, uh, to, for, for firms in banking and finance to adapt, but it's far easier for them to do so than it is for other sectors. Hence, the, it's almost a backhanded compliment. It's, it's, it's a, you know, we're going to leave, you're going to have to make quite significant changes to your business, but it's because you're big enough and you're strong enough and you can. So I just slightly challenge that, that narrative that the city's been hung out to try. Um, we have plenty of questions in the Q&A and they're all great questions. And uh, unfortunately, there is not going to be enough time to answer them all but I'll do my best and ask you to be uh, as crisp as possible, uh, mm -hmm. of course, substantial, but crisp in your responses. So we have a question from uh, Stuart Wood. Sorry, uh, let me get the question. Uh, Reuters in th is this morning reporting that the EU has decided to give full equivalence based market access to US clearing houses with no time limit. How much of an impact will this have on UK clearing houses? William. Uh, I, I don't know the exact answer. What I do know is it, it's another example of the EU ratcheting, ratcheting up the pressure on UK and EU firms to relocate, to develop a local capacity uh, for clearing inside the EU instead of relying on clearing through the London market. Nathan? There is a deep issue here uh, as you see those kinds of, uh, of, of announcements which as an American, that sounds great to me. Uh, but uh, the question is, uh, who's gonna win uh, as a result of Brexit? And I think the continent is playing it really tough here. But uh, I think we're seeing uh, in some of the swap state in particular, uh, uh, that New York and Chicago uh, are winning. And uh, is this activity gonna leave uh, Europe uh, and move. As I said, I think a lot of activity will stay, but to what extent will we end up more splintered and will, uh, will, will the United States uh, and Asia end up winners? I think those are some of the big, uh, big questions looming out there. William, you showed the ISDA data on this, and uh, indeed we see the, the U.S. winning, uh, still a relatively small share, but uh, growing rapidly. Uh, at this point, there is no indication of the split between UK and EU in the rest, in, in what you showed at Europe on your slide, right? Not the, yeah, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, a number of questions about equivalence. That's probably not a surprise. Uh, let me take a few of them. Uh, Florence Autre is asking why you didn't mention the equivalence decisions uh, for crime dependencies, uh, uh, William. So Jersey, Guernsey, uh, Bermuda. Uh, they have equivalents for audit, uh, uh, capital requirements uh, uh, regulation, solvency two, depending on uh, the jurisdiction. Um, what um, is that important? Uh, is that important for the city? How do you look at those uh, uh, crimes of empire uh, uh, that uh, the UK still have with more equivalents than the UK, um, uh, not mainland, but uh, England and. Uh, uh, it, to be honest, it's not an area that we've looked at in great detail, but talking with uh, some people in those crown dependencies, they certainly see it as an opportunity, um, given the, the effectively the sort of one foot in each camp, as it were, 
Um, but it's not something it's not something that we've looked at in great detail, so I'll be uncomfortable answering. I think uh, Mark uh, Mark Boliet uh, Boli might be able to answer that more effectively than me. Uh, I have uh, questions, or actually um, remarks, by uh, Graham Bishop uh, and uh, also um, sorry, I'm scrolling down. Christian Lopez on uh, the coolant process at a higher level. Christian is asking how the UK could exercise the appropriate leverage, I quote, to gain more uh, equivalence or to stop being dependent on it. So that's a very general question, I guess. Uh, and uh, Graham, uh, Graham Bishop uh, actually has asked for the floor, so why don't I allow him to talk? Graham, you need to unmute. Yes, thank you, Nicola. Uh, very interesting discussion. And um, <clears throat> I'd just like to get uh, William to elaborate a bit on the cooperation agreement, which is uh, due in March. In, in my view, this is going to be, anyone who's expecting this to be um, a big step forward in equivalence is going to be very disappointed. Uh, as I read it, it, it's all about the process of dialogue, cooperation, transparency, who's, what, who has phone numbers, etc. It's absolutely not about agreeing, agreeing common regulations, which might be a foundation for subsequent equivalence rulings. So William's comments. Uh Graham, I completely agree. Um, my my comments earlier about lowering expectations on that are more a response to some of the uh, some of the more excitable um, uh, analysis and commentary in some corners of the press in the UK that have been talking up uh, the next few months as right. We're finally going to get a proper deal here. Um, the best that I would imagine to come out of that agreement in in March would be something along the lines of a regulatory cooperation agreement, a commitment to regular dialogue in the same way that the, the, the UK has such an agreement, informal agreement uh, with the US. Nathan, um, you've been in those negotiations, uh, regulatory dialogue between the EU and the US and all that stuff. Uh, how do you look at it? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 and you mean specifically regarding equivalence? Uh, yeah, and, and basically the, the interplay between equivalence and this structured process of regulatory dialogue. So there, there, there are a number of mechanisms for U.S. regulators and European Union regulators uh, to exchange views. And I would say as a general matter, it's, uh, it's constructive, it's effective. And uh, I think that that's because both sides broadly respect uh, what the other uh, is doing. And uh, I think that's one reason why on the US side, we found the discussion about equivalence and it being as fraught as it was and as it continues to be uh, uh, a little bit surprising. And uh, it happened after I left Treasury, but my understanding is that ultimately the swaps execution facilities equivalence uh, was granted when uh, certain folks at the CME started advocating threats uh, as to access for EU, uh, uh, EU uh, customers. So it actually got to kind of a tit for tat uh, sort of thing. Um, I think that that's more the exception rather than the rule in the financial stability, financial regulatory space. But, uh, you know, it, 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 these, these equivalence discussions uh, are, are a fraught and difficult. And I think you're hearing Andrew Bailey already flag this for folks, saying that what the EU is asking for is, is problematic. And it's going to be hard, and uh, uh, we can't pre-commit to always make the EU happy. And if that's what it requires to get uh, equivalence, that may be a, a bar too high. Uh, William, I was struck by this testimony of Andrew Bailey, I think, at the House of Lords uh, earlier this month, where he said, you know, uh, really, we want our own strategic autonomy. He didn't use those terms, but that's, he said, we, we want to be able to set the rules, and uh, if we cannot do that for equivalence and by by equivalence. Um, that was pretty blunt. Uh, how much of that, in your view, is a specific Bank of England view because they have a, of course, they put a premium on being able to set the rules versus the general position of the UK government? 
Um, I, th I think it's a, it's a little bit like um, the 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 old joke that if you know, if you've hurt your knee, the worst person to go to is a to ask about how to heal it is a knee surgeon because what he'll do is say that you need surgery. Um, if you want to ask, you know, what should the future framework be for UK regulation? Um, don't ask a regulator, don't ask a supervisor because of, and I'm being slightly flippant here, but obviously they want to have control over supervision and regulation. Uh, and, and with equivalence, they would lose a huge amount uh, of input into that. Um, but I think though that there is a growing um, recognition. And I, and I think, you know, given the decisions that have been taken and that have steered us to where we are over the past four years, I think rightly so, now there is a growing, a growing sort of recognition that equivalence only solves a few small areas of the Brexit puzzle. Um, most firms have had to take the, the, the hit from Brexit on the chin to relocate. Having done so, they've now got that access to EU markets and to EU clients in the back. So if we push for more equivalence, are we, are we, are we expecting firms to sort of unwind the, the relocation and the contingency plans that they've done? Or, or is there actually now an opportunity to say, okay, we are where we are, what can we do about it? How can we develop focus on London as a, as a, as a non-EU financial center? Uh, how much business can still be, uh, how much EU business can still be done through London? And the answer is quite a lot. It's not all dependent on equivalence. So we have a number of comments on this in the Q&A, including for Pierre Bisson, for example, who says more things than Brexit affect the geographical uh, distribution, AI, big data, Zoom meetings and more. They, may, they all may decrease uh, the importance of global centers. Uh, of course, that raises the question of regulation because what remains territorial is regulation and supervision. So, so how do you think about this interplay between technology, even you know, the pandemic lockdown, mm -hmm. meaning territory is less relevant uh, and the lingering uh, importance of territorial uh, rule setting and, uh, and legislation? I guess uh, I'm old school on this, and my feeling is that uh, uh, the agglomeration uh, externalities of having a lot of talent in a uh, uh, geographical uh, proximity is, is powerful. Uh, I think it generates more ideas, it creates thick labor markets, and uh, with, uh, you know, whether, whether you're thinking about coders for AI, uh, or, or more traditional financial uh, sector activities, I think we'll continue to have meaningful financial uh, sectors. And Nicola, as you say, I think the realities of regulation uh, are going to ensure, and we're even seeing that here, as arguably the European Union sees this as a commercial opportunity and uh, is, is, is putting increased constraints uh, and some of them are likely to be uh, uh, permanent increased constraints on the nature of financial activities between the European Union and the UK. So uh, I, I, on balance, I think we'll continue to be in a world where there will be major financial centers. Arnab Das has a, a comment also on this issue of, uh, you know, financial centers and he writes, given the idea of sectoral specialization in different EU capitals, is it fair to say that the EU isn't really going to have one dominant financial center, but several centers of excellence in different member states. Uh, do, how do you see the time sequence on this, uh, William? Do you think we will have scattered activity and then regrouping in one center over the medium long term, or will it stay in several places uh, for the foreseeable future? What's your baseline scenario? The, the, the baseline would be that the, the, the straw man argument in this debate about Brexit and the city has always been there's no single financial centre in Europe that can challenge or overtake London. But, but I don't think any, any single financial centre in Europe has ever claimed to be in a position to do so. If any centre were to try, it, it's not going to work. And I think what we're more likely to see is that this first wave of relocations is very heavily sector orientated with the possible exception of Paris. I think if, if it'll be interesting to see if Paris as a financial center continues to thrive and to grow as a more generalist, you know, EU wide generalist financial center relative to Dublin, Luxembourg, 
Amsterdam and Frankfurt as more specialist. But I can imagine a longer term, uh, I can imagine multiple financial centers in Europe thriving in a competitive environment on a sector specialization basis. What I can't imagine is any more than one or two of those financial centers trying to set themselves up and flourish as a generalist alternative to London. Uh, Nathan? Let me just briefly add, uh, I think that uh, those arguments are compelling. I'd say a caveat is for that multiple centers of excellence model to really take hold. And I think that is one that's, that's logical and one that's possible. I think you're going to need capital markets union to continue to make progress. Yes, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of questions about that. And, uh, and William and I have had many discussions. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm slightly uh, cynical on the slogan of capital markets union. But, uh, but there's, a, there's a, an additional uh, question or reflection from my colleague Caroline, uh, Caroline Atkinson. Uh, COVID has forced financial firms, of course, to manage remotely. And uh, the, how much does that change the calculus around centers with geographic concentration? I mean, you've alluded to this, but can you, can, can you give us a little bit more of how you think about that? So I'll, uh, I'll kick off this one. Uh, so where we are now, I kind of think of it as, as two poles. Where we were uh, before uh, the pandemic was essentially all physical interaction. You now we had video conferences and the like, but let's just stay there. Where we were kind of in March, April, May was all virtual interaction. And I think where we're going to land in the new normal and the new equilibrium is somewhere in between. Uh, and I think what we'll have to sketch out is exactly uh, where, where it falls. My guess is the most major financial institutions, the most employees, instead of being in the office physically at their desk five days a week, are going to be physically at their desk three to four days a week. Uh, which then so they, they still will have a desk. Suggest a fair amount of physical agglomeration and proximity. William? I think you, one of the ways that we look at Brexit in terms of employment is that it has accelerated the sort of the restructuring of the industry, a process of restructuring that might otherwise have taken five to 10 years. And I think that COVID will accelerate that again. What I'm talking about here is when, when an investment bank or an asset management firm looks at its footprint across Europe and it sees that 90, 95% of its staff in Europe are in the UK and 90% of them are in the middle of London. A lot of the relocation activity that we've seen around Brexit is not being caused by Brexit. It's, it's, Brexit is the occasion to rethink where firms should locate their business. We've seen a massive increase in employment in financial services, mainly mid-office, IT, support, legal, in Poland, for example. And, and I think that COVID is gonna accelerate that. So financial centers become where firms themselves want to concentrate be supervised and locate their front office. Um, and then there is a competing set of financial centers, which is who's going to be supporting those in future. Yeah, that's right. If you go to Warsaw these days, you see a lot of uh, high rise building growing up. Um, uh, that's actually quite spectacular. Um, there's a question from Bjorn Willem, which connects to that. How do you interpret a very substantial drop in official job vacancies in London financial sector since 2015? Uh, there's been a, a very uh, spectacular chart. I don't remember. I think Bloomberg published that uh, recently. Uh, uh, Morgan McKinley, the uh, London Employment Monitor, uh, according to Bjorn. Um, William, maybe briefly on this. Um, firstly, the, the after, immediately after the referendum, um, that monitor was significantly boosted by enormous demand for legal compliance <laughs> uh, operational <laughs> specialists to deal with Brexit. Um, but it comes back to the point Nathan was making earlier. I don't think it's right to draw the you know, to use this. How many jobs have moved from London as the comparator? But this, chart, this chart is really uh, striking. I mean, it's a, it's a collapse basically. The picture it paints. Uh, so in, in new jobs. Chart, yeah, and uh, if this chart is something to uh, take for granted, then the UK should be very afraid in terms of the development of the city. Do you think that's uh, alarmist? I haven't seen the specific chart, but the point I was going to make is that the, you, probably the, re, you know, the main reason why these jobs, there's been a fall in, in new vacancies in financial services in London, 
is that more of that recruitment is now taking place in new positions uh, in the EU and elsewhere. I, um, so I, it's not the movement of a particular job. It's jobs in future that will never come to the EU. That's right. Um, I, uh, for those who want to see the chart, I tweeted it uh, yesterday. Um, a question from Patrick Hanan, um, uh, also my colleague at the Peterson Institute, and I'm afraid it will be the last one given time. Um, is it right to assume that since most of the geographical shifts are made within existing multinational firms, there will not be a big international movement of profits, or will there be a relocation of profits because of new legal structures uh, that are used for the, the post-Brexit environment? Nice. Well, as, as uh, someone who spent a fair amount of time also wrestling with the European Union about where various kinds of revenues should be taxed. Uh, it would be my expectation that if you, particularly now that you have separately operating subsidiaries in the, United, uh, in the European Union, that uh, EU tax uh, uh, officials will want to find a way to get, uh, to get uh, their, what they view as their appropriate share uh, of, of the profits. So, I, I do think that this may have some implications for tax basis. What's that space? Uh, thank you so much, uh, William Wright, uh, Nathan Chief. That was a splendid discussion. Uh, very active participation from our audience. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. Uh, very, uh, we'll, we'll have you again. This is something we want to monitor. It's a major structural change uh, for the European financial sector, but also for the global financial sector. And there are so many uh, important threads in there. Uh, we'll have the next session of financial statements on um, February the 10th, and we'll discuss uh, big tech regulation, not just from a financial uh, perspective, but kind of holistically with Yun Shin from the Bank for, for International Settlements uh, and uh, Rory McFarker, who is also a former colleague at the Peterson Institute and now at MasterCard. This will, I think, be a very, another very stimulating discussion on another topical issue. But again, many, many thanks to our two speakers today. Uh, very uh, challenging uh, thoughts on uh, a fast moving reality. Thanks very much. And uh, hopefully see you soon at Financial Statements and on other uh, Peterson Institute web event series. Thank you.